happened to us than for all of you that are on social media. I encourage you to uh, share it uh, so that our church can get the word out uh, to those that are not here this morning. And who knows, maybe someone that's looking for a church and would decide to join us uh, at our next service right here uh, at Willow Fern. So if you'll do that for me, I would greatly uh, appreciate it. If you don't like the sermon, well, uh, don't share it. So that's how I know if you like the sermon, if you share it. If you don't, I'll know you just didn't like it, okay? Um, no, I'm just joking about that, but kind of not, all right? Isaiah uh, chapter 59, the Word of God uh, is taking us there uh, this morning, or God is taking us there in God's Word. So Isaiah chapter 59 you had homework to do if you were here last Sunday morning. You had homework to do, and some of you reached out to me after that you'd done your homework, being the good students that you are, and you said, Jody, I'd done my homework today, okay? What was the homework? Well, if you're here, and you were here last Sunday, and now you're here this Sunday, and you might be thinking like I did a lot of times in school, I forgot to do my homework. Okay, and so I hope that you did not forget, but if you did forget, then I would encourage you to go home and do it today. Okay, I won't give you the rest of the week, do it today. But here was what the homework was we said in a seven day period, which should not be very hard to do, find five minutes. If you cannot find five minutes free time in your schedule, you are far too busy. And so we said, take five minutes. What are we taking five minutes for? To get away from everything. Our phones, the TV, the news, the media, social media, the kids, the spouse, work. Get away from the busyness of life and for five minutes have communication with God. And sit by yourself wherever that it may be. Scotty and Cheryl sent me a wonderful picture of them on top of a mountain with a majestic view of the scenery of here in eastern Kentucky, and they went to one of the highest places that you could go in our county and where you could oversee uh, thousands of beautiful acreage that God has blessed us with around here and the trees and the uh, crest of the mountains and the beauty of uh, God's splendor. And they said, we just done our homework. So regardless of where you went, I said, find five minutes to where you can commune with God and ask this question. If not for God, where would I be? If not for God, where would I be? I actually done my homework. Now, I was a little bit of a great student um, this morning uh, or this week. I've got a lot of catching up to do. I was never a good student in school. I always tried to skirt by. I did not try to do my best. It was only till I made my way into college and realized that education was so important that, that the more you got of it, the more they would pay you. And so it was only then when we put money to it that I got excited about learning. And so this week I spent more than five minutes with God, and there was a few days that I ask myself, God, if not for you, where would I be? I'll tell you a journey that I took yesterday that I got all kinds of opportunities to talk to God and say, God, if it were not for you, where would I be? Parker had a football game in Pineville, Kentucky, in Bell County. If you've never made that trip, I would encourage you to do so. And so we made our, I was by myself. They had to be there early. I didn't want to be there early. They might have had to stay late, or there was a probability they were going to stay late. I didn't want to stay late. I had church work to do. So I left at just enough time to get there, and as soon as it was over, I got out of there. It took me about an hour and 40 to 45 minutes of driving through God's country. And when I say God's country, my friend, I'm talking about God's country. So I went down through Manchester, and I went almost into Barberville. I turned left, and I went through the mountains, and I, I was on a two-lane road. I was on a one-lane road. I was on all but a gravel road, and finally I made it there. And when I got out of there, and I left, and I came back, I thought I was coming back the same way. And I come to a sign that said, Welcome to Harlan County. And I thought, Oh, God, I'm going to have to go over that mountain. 
And sure enough, there was that rock quarry, the top of the mountain, and I knew I was coming through Harlan County. And you know what? I, I didn't I didn't regret it. I thought, well, Lord, it's your beauty, and I'm going to enjoy it. And along the way, I'm going to ask myself at the same question that I ask all the congregation to spend time with you this week and ask. I'm going to ask you, God, here I am. God, don't distract me. I'm coming down this mountain. God, don't, don't distract me too much. But I said, God, if it were not for you, where would I be? And my friend, if you're really honest with God, and God will always be honest with you, we would find that our life would be in a far worse condition today without God than it is with God. You may be struggling in life. You may have problems. We all do. But you may say, God, or you may say, Jody, this is not a good time for me. But I'm still telling you that with God, life is far better than it would be without Him. I don't see how people are living today in not being in a right relationship with God. I believe that the coming of the Lord is so is, is so nigh that I'm looking for him to come today. I mean, if you look around and you see what's going on in the world that we live, the tragedies, the disease, the hatred, the envy, the bitterness, the divide, our pulling away from God and having no reverence to him. My friend, it wouldn't surprise me if, if God told his son Jesus to come back and get his people before I end the sermon. Am I saying that to scare you? No, I'm saying that because I'm ready to go. And if God were to come back, then I know that I'm going to be in heaven forever. And if you don't know that with a surety in your own heart, then chances are you need to get right with God today. If not for God in your life, where would you be? Now here's Isaiah 59. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now we see a tragedy in this verse. And so the tragedy is sin. And what sin does in our relationship with God. You cannot be in a right relationship with God and harboring sin in your life. It's very simple. Now I want to read to you something and the message this morning is if not for God there would be no remedy for sin. Now you're going to hear me say that word remedy a lot this morning. If not for God, there would be no remedy for sin. Now Isaiah gave to us an indication of what was happening here in, in the biblical context. He said, God has not changed. Now first we need to get that. That's the first point. When you're looking at Isaiah 59, verse 1, Isaiah said God's hand is not shortened, and he is, that he cannot save, and his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. In other words, what Isaiah is saying is, God hasn't changed. God is not going to change. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God, in his immutable presence and power, is never going to change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You and I are going to change. The world is going to change. Time is going to change, but God will never change. Malachi 3 and 6 said, God spoke to the people and said, I am the Lord, I change not. God, or Jody, how do you know that God doesn't change? Because, my friend, all you got to do is read. Remember when Ryan got up this morning and he said, I only want to teach you two things. There was, a, there was a, a, a verse and a chorus. That's the kind of learning I need to do when it comes to singing and music. If you can learn one verse and one chorus, you've got it licked. And we done a wonderful job, and he said the words. It's simple. Well, I'm telling you this morning that God doesn't change. How do you know, Jody, that God doesn't change? Malachi 3, 6, God said, I am the Lord, I change not. Now, Peyton could understand that this morning. Amen? Amen. And so we know that God doesn't change. So the problem is, the problem is not God, 
The problem is us. And the Bible says, Isaiah said, your sins have separated you between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Therefore, the sins of the world have separated the world from God and the world needs a remedy. Your sins have separated you from God. Therefore, you needed a remedy. And we know what a remedy is. And we especially know what it is today. Our pharmacists in here, our medical personnel that's in here, they certainly know what a remedy is. A remedy is a medicine or a treatment for a disease. What is the remedy? If you've got a certain illness, there is a certain remedy for that illness. Now I want you to listen this morning to what Charles Spurgeon said. 1872. 1872, here was what was said. He stood up in front of his congregation, being the great man of God and the great speaker that he was, in 1872, and he said, I'm preaching this morning a sermon entitled, A Simple Remedy. And he read from Isaiah, where that Isaiah prophesied, by his stripes we are healed. And therefore, he was saying the remedy to our sin is the stripes of Christ. And I want to read this. This is kind of lengthy, but it's, I, I think it's so impressive. The first part of that sermon, Charles Spurgeon said, Everywhere at this present hour, we meet with some form or other sickness. No place, however helpful, is free from cases of disease. As for moral disease, it is all around us. And we are thankful to add that the remedy is everywhere within reach. The beloved physician has prepared a healing medicine which can be reached by all classes of people, which is available in every climate, at every hour, under every circumstance, and effectual in every case wherever it is received. Of that medicine we shall speak this morning, praying that we may have God's help in doing so. And he said, we are ministering a simple remedy. Can you imagine being there at that particular time and hear the preacher get up and say, we've got sickness everywhere, and one of those sicknesses is a moral disease of which we have a remedy. We now, being 150 years later, here we are, and, and I'm standing up this morning, and God has sent me to Isaiah, and in the book of Isaiah, we read about a disease. A moral disease that has separated us from God. What is the remedy? The remedy today for sin is the same as it was 150 years ago in 1872 when Charles Spurgeon preached the sermon, A Simple Remedy, and said the remedy to sin is by Christ's stripes we are healed. And that's the same remedy today. There was a mouse that was put by the owner of a pet snake. If you have a pet snake, my friend, we can't, we can't be friends. Okay, you're weird. And don't let anybody tell you that you're normal. You're strange. If you bring a house, I mean a snake into your house on purpose, there's something wrong with you. If there's a snake that comes into my house, I'm leaving my house. I hope he can pay the mortgage. I hope he can pay the utilities because I'm not. And so there was a mouse that was put into the pet snake's cage. And the owner of the snake put the mouse by the tail and put him down to feed the pet snake. But the snake was asleep. And so realizing the circumstance the mouse was in, the mouse began to take his hinder legs and he began to kick as frantically as he could the wood shavings that were in the bottom of the cage. And he was kicking it towards the snake. Not in an attempt to wake the snake up, but in an attempt to hide the snake. For the mouse thought, if I can hide the snake, if I can cover the snake up, I will be safe. He thought his remedy was to cover the snake up. But the teller of the illustration says, no matter how hard we try to cover or deny our sinful nature, it's fool's work. Sin will eventually awake from sleep 
shake off its cover, and were it not for the saving grace of the master's hand, the owner of the pet snake realized the, the trying efforts of the mouse, and he felt so sorry for the mouse and him scurrying around trying to put up the wood shavings to cover up the snake that he reached his hand into the cage and grabbed the mouse by the tail, took the mouse outside and set him free. He deserved it. He tried that hard. He deserved it. He felt sorry for the mouse, so he let him go. The illustration goes on to say, were it not for the saving grace of the master's hand, sin would eat us alive. Is that not true? If you believe that's true, say amen. The Bible says what is, or I ask you what is sin. The Bible tells us explicitly and simply what sin is. The Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 17, if you know to do something and don't do it, it's sin. These are simple verses this morning. This is a simple sermon. This is not something that we need some great philosophical debate. It's not some great theological type orator or anything of that nature. No. This is just me telling you that we have a problem. We have a disease. You say, oh, I know, I know, Jody, we've got a disease. We've got a pandemic, and it's killed hundreds of thousands of people, and it's still wreaking havoc today. My friend, I'm telling you right now that, that the coronavirus will never kill as many people as sin has. It's not near as deadly as sin is. It's not near as contagious as the lust of the flesh is. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to that person it's sin. If God says don't do it and you do it, my friend, it's a sin against the commandments of God. And it's so important that you can go, and I'm not going to preach much on this. I actually had it in my notes. I took it out, and I thought, God, I ain't got enough time to put all of this stuff in there. I want to make sure that I give everything that I can to let them know that we have a remedy for sin. And if they stay in their sin, it's because they refuse the cure. And so the Bible says that God instructed the children of Israel when they come into their land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he established them and he gave them the commandments. We know it as the Mosaic law, the commandments of God. They were to honor the commandments of God and love the commandments of God. And you can go down in verse, uh, or in Deuteronomy there in your outline there towards the bottom. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Bible says, if you'll keep these commandments and statutes and judgments, God says, you may be able to live and multiply, but... Look at the top of that second part of the outline where I've highlighted that three-letter word that means the world in this verse. God says, if you'll keep my commandments and statutes, that thou mayest live and multiply, but, but if thine heart turn away so that you will not hear, and you shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, God says, I will denounce unto you this day that you shall perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the earth, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. And he said, I call to record today that if you live in sin, you'll die. But if you keep my commandments, you'll live. How important was it? God established a way for the children of Israel to be in remembrance of the commandments of God and on their cuff of their sleeves. They would, they would begin to sew on blue ribbons, so to speak, on the fringes of their cuffs. It might not have been in style, my friend. They weren't worried about being in style. They weren't worried about what looked good down the runway. They were concerned about making sure that they did not forget that God wanted to be their God. And God had gave them commandments. It was a reminder of the commandments of God so that every move they made, they were reminded to be obedient to the commandments of God. It'd be better if we started tying some strings on our clothes too. So that we'd be reminded every day that if we are going to live, we must come out from sin. How dangerous is sin? The Bible says this about sin. The wages of sin is death. 
The wages of sin is death, and you can't escape sin. How do I know you can't escape sin? And no, I didn't forget it. No, I didn't skip it. Go back to the first page of your outline where it says the ideal of the heathen. You said, I was hoping he just forgot about that. I'm not going to forget. I've got it right here in front of me, just like you do. And the Bible says in Psalm David, David even recognized that he was born into sin. Psalm 51 and 5, Behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans 3.23 doubles down on the same fact that you and I are sinners, and it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need a remedy, and the remedy is the cure for our sin. We need it. And without it, where would we be? That's why we're ministering this morning. Without God, if not for God, where would our remedy be for sin? Why does it matter? I'll tell you that here in just a little bit. But here's the ideal of the world. I jotted this down. This comes from D.L. Moody's monthly. And it says this, Man calls sin an accident, but God calls it an abomination. Man calls it a defect. God calls it a disease. Man calls it error. God calls it enmity. Man calls it liberty. God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it a trifle. God calls it a tragedy. Man calls it a mistake. When they sin, God calls it madness. Man calls sin a weakness. And God calls it willful. My friend, that's the truth. We have righted all the wrongs and wronged all the rights, seemingly in our world today. But at the end of the deal, at the end of the ages, when it all comes to rest, what's going to separate you from God is the sin in your life. That's how important that it is. Why well, minister for 45 minutes this morning, Jody, about sin? Because if you've still got it in your life, you can't go to heaven. You still have sin in your life. You can't be in a right relationship with God. And I'm going to prove that to you here in just a little bit, that if you still have sin in your life, if you're abiding in sin and living in accordance to the flesh, if your desire is still to the flesh and the lust thereof, you cannot and will not be in the presence of Almighty God. It's impossible. And you say, well, whose fault is it? Do I need to go back to the text where the Bible said God does not change? If you're in sin, it's your fault. For there is a remedy. There is a cure. Look at the world we live in today, and this is not a political motive. This is not anything on which side I'm on or which fence I'm on. I understand both sides of it. I get it, and I respect the opinions. But can you imagine that there would be a cure for the virus that we see that is plaguing our land today? And so many people, if they are presented with the opportunity to at least have a vaccine, if not a cure, a vaccine uh, for the disease that even half of the people today are saying no. I wonder how many people are being presented the gospel of Jesus Christ today as a remedy for their sins. And guess what they're saying? Nah. I don't want it. No. I'll pass on it. I mean, can you imagine that I'm standing here this morning ministering and I can take you to Luke chapter 16 and, and you read this story when you get home. This can be your homework this week. Don't forget it. And if you forgot it last week, double up. <laughs> I'm bringing a paddle next week. We're going to set some fields on fire if people don't do their homework. We're going back to old school. You can go to Luke chapter 16 and read a story that the Bible says between two men, the rich man and Lazarus. The Bible says both of them died. We know that all death is going to come to us all. It's once appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And in the judgment, one went to hell, one went to heaven. How do we know that? Because the Bible says it. I mean, the Bible says that, that the that Lazarus was resting in Abraham's bosom in the presence of God, and in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes. If you die in your sin today, Jody, will you tell me if my family dies in their sin today, what's going to happen? Can I tell you now so that it's not so bad when it does happen? 
If you're here this morning, my friend, you die in your sins. In hell, you'll lift up your eyes. You say, man, I, I don't want that to happen. Well, good. Because God's provided a remedy. You say, I don't, Jody, I don't want to go to hell. I don't either. I don't either. I heard somebody say just this week, and they said it wrongly. I didn't correct them because I understood what they meant, but it was wrong in their intentions. And not to embarrass them, but they said, I, if I don't go to heaven, I'm going to be devastated. I've worked so hard to get there. I'm not working hard to get there. Because if I'm working hard to get to heaven, that's my remedy. And I don't want the remedy to be when I stand before God to say, God, did I do good? Because I didn't. God, did I work hard enough? Because I've not. The Bible says that our righteousness, the best we can do, is filthy rags. I mean, we've got sin in our life. And what's the remedy? Is it for me to try hard, work hard, do good, try, try, try? People are going to hell every day trying to get to heaven. Amen? I mean, my friend, that was a good point. You should have said amen if you didn't. You're dead sorry this morning. I mean, people are trying every day. People are going to hell every day trying to get to heaven. And that, thank you, Bobby. And that's so sad. It's so sad that people are making their eternal home in hell trying to get to heaven. Why is trying to get to heaven not going to work? Because that's your remedy. You say, I'm going to do what I think is best. That's your remedy. I've had people to me, I've quoted the scripture to them, and I've tried to prove to them, right here's what the scripture said. And they said, I don't believe it. I'm going to do it this way. That's your remedy. And there's only one remedy, and it's not yours. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. I'll get back to Lazarus and, rich, and the rich man here in just a second. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 18, therefore as by the offense of one, speaking of Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one, speaking of Christ, the free gift, came upon all men to justification of life. I love, I love that word justify. Why do I love that word justify? Because that's my remedy. One of these days I want to be justified in the eyes of God. I, I, want, to, I want God to see his son Jesus and not me. If God sees me, I'm out. If God sees my past, I'm out. If God sees my failed attempts in trying, I'm out. If God sees the sermons I preached as a means by which I was trying to get to heaven, I'm out. I mean, Sarah tells me every Sunday about the mistakes I make in the bulletin. I know, I'm dumb. <laughs> just let it go. I said, I just want to think I'm smart and not know any different than for me to think I'm smart and be proven otherwise. And so the Bible says by the free gift that came to Jody and the free gift that came when you put your name in there upon the justification of life. Why do we need a remedy? Because when Lazarus died and went to hell or when the rich man died and went to hell, while Lazarus died and went to heaven, the Bible says in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. There's not a space that you go for a little while before you're tormented. The moment you close your eyes in sin, you're going to lift them up in torment. I mean, just like that. You'll know, I mean, the undertaker will not know you're dead before you're in torment. And that's a shame. Some people are, are in torment for days and hours even before the family gets to see their body in a casket. And so what's our remedy? That paints a grim picture, I know. But we ought to rejoice this morning. How can we rejoice, preacher? You said I, you said I could be in hell before the undertaker knows I'm dead. How in the world 
can we rejoice over that? The rejoicing is this, is that that don't have to be the case. There is a remedy for your sin and my sin and the sins of the world. No one, no one, no one, no one has to go to hell. No one. And so, what's the remedy? The remedy is this. I give you three verses. You see that we're almost coming to a close and we're right on time. We've done good this morning. The Bible says this in Isaiah 44 and verse 22. God says, I have what? I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, God says, for I have redeemed you. I have blotted out your sins. Come back to me, for I have redeemed them. Micah 7 and 19, God says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And will and thou will cast all our sins, their sins, into the depths of the sea. Psalms 103 and verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's my remedy. What is my remedy? There's a song that says, This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Why am I praising my Savior all the day long? Because he's my remedy. He's my cure. Without Christ, I'm still in my sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I know I have no hope. Jody, what's the answer to the question? If not for God, there would be no remedy for sin. If you and I don't have a remedy for sin, we have no hope of heaven. So what's the medicine? What's the cure? What's the remedy? It's to come to Christ. I read this week, it says, when we became Christians, our imputed sin is pardoned once and for all. And our sin nature is progressively transformed to reflect the character of Christ through the indwelling presence of God. Day by day, we get better and better and better. We know that to be sanctification. Holiness to the soul is what health is to the body. You should write that down. You gym goers that are taking care of that body and trying to take care of it. Oh, I'm jealous of you. I mean, I really am. I'm trying. It's a struggle every day. But I know this, that if I take care of my body and the health of my body, it's going to pay off in the long run. What's going to help my soul along the way? Holiness to the soul is what health is to the body. Every day, every day you fall more in love with the remedy than you were the day before. And if you ask yourself the question like we all did this week, as I was coming across them 10,000 mountains last night to come home, and I said, God, if not for you, where would I be? And you know what? The only thing that can keep popping up above all things is this. God, if it was not for you, I'd still be in sin. I would still be in my sin. But thanks be unto God, I no longer live in sin. But I am the master of sin. Why do I say that? Because I read this week where Robert Jeffers preached a sermon about the remedy for sin. And he said this, before we are saved, sin is the ruler of our life. Sin is our master, but after we are saved, sin becomes our slave. The only sin in your life is the sin you allow. That's it. For the Bible says that we have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. And the only sin that creeps into your life is the one that you allow because you're the master of it. There was one time where sin was the master of your life. Now that you're saved, you're the master of it. Sin has become your slave, and what you allow is what creeps in. What creeps in is what you allow. The Bible says, and I close with this, and I go to Isaiah, and I read to you the same words that the great preacher read one time. And when he said we have sickness all around, just as we do today, 
how fitting that it is. God, how great you are. The Bible says this. All we like sheep have gone astray. Well, let's go back one more verse to pick up where the, the great preacher said. He was, this is not on there. I want to read this to you and I want you to listen. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Speaking of Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. You know who that's talking about? It's talking about Jesus and what he did for you. He took your stripes. He took your punishment. He laid all your mistakes, not the ones that have been made, the ones that will be made. He laid all of your sins on his life and took them to the cross. The old saying is, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was your sins and my sins that held him to the cross. That's why he was there. He didn't deserve to be there, but he went there for you. That's our remedy. When you think of Christ, my friend, you ought to see the greatest medicine that's ever been. It is the cure for the greatest disease, and that the disease being sin. Stand with us this morning all over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity.